Ephesians chapter 4, I'll read from verse 17 to verse 32. We'll read it here at the outset, and perchance that we might not have time to get through um, some of these particulars that Paul is mentioning here. But Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 to 32. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Now he gives the contrast, but ye have not so learned Christ. So it's their mindset, their mentality that causes them to live and to act the way that they have. It's what they've been taught. It's what they've been nurtured in. But now he shifts the picture, but we haven't, lear we haven't learned that way. You have so not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. That may comfort some that we can be angry, but uh, it says be angry and sin not. We can be provoked to anger, but we need to know how to uh, process that, process it, bring it subject to the fruits of the Spirit. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. You may be seated. We've, are, we've been ministering on the, uh, the subject of, the, uh, of who is my neighbor. And in looking at that, uh, we're examining the parable of the Good Samaritan. It's how we most often would think about it in Luke chapter 10. And the, the question is asked by the lawyer who comes to Jesus and what can I do to inherit eternal life? And it prompts Jesus to ask him, well, what, is, what do you read in the law? And he reads that to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, and mind and to love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, that's good. You've said, well, do that and you'll be well. But then this convicted the lawyer, and the lawyer says, ah, well, then who is my neighbor? And so it's in response to that question of who is my neighbor that Jesus gives the parable of the Good Samaritan. And we've been looking at these different actors and these different characters that are in this parable. And so I'm just going to jump right into the middle of it, knowing that we're all very familiar uh, with, this, with this parable. But we've been looking at it this way, that Jesus is challenging the lawyer to actually put himself in the shoes of the thieves, of the priest, of the Levite, and even the Good Samaritan. Maybe we could even say, put yourself in the shoes of the one who's befallen on his way from Jerusalem down to Jericho. But he's wanting to use these characters in a way to challenge this lawyer in his thinking, how he narrowed his view of what a neighbor was, how he narrowed his obligation to humanity. And there's a lot of different ways that this parable is approached. Some look at it as an allegory of man being in sin. Others look at it very strictly as Jesus correcting um, uh, his attitude towards others and that it just speaks to being a good human being and being a humanitarian to everyone and not being driven by prejudice or, or bigotry. But as we were looking at it last time, we were looking how that whether we looked at the thieves, uh, the priest or the, Lord, uh, or the Levite, each were part of a social structure that behaved according to a certain expected norms. There was a normative behavior, a way that you acted. And so we were looking at how they were part of a culture and being part of a culture, there were certain things that were expected of them. There were certain attitudes that they demonstrated because the group, it kind of characterized the group. And we were examining how all of them acted under the influence of a group dynamic. They, all, they acted according to the culture, whether they were in the group of thieves, and so the group 
kind of caused them to do a certain thing, or they were part of the group, and even though absent from the group as a priest and a Levite, they still were susceptible to the culture of the group. And we were pointing out that we're susceptible to those same kind of dynamics today. That if we're not careful, we behave under a group attitude or we act with the crowd. And we looked at Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21. Now it says, there are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. And we were looking at these devices that we all have in our hearts. And I'm not talking about the device in your pocket or your purse or the device you left in the car or the device that you got grounded from earlier this week. We're talking about the device that's actually in our thinking, a device that's in our heart. It means in invention or perception or thoughts. It's actually calculations and instincts that we all have within our hearts. So every man, every woman, every boy, every girl has a device, many devices in their hearts. And he contrasts it with the counsel of the Lord. So the counsel of the Lord, that's sure, that's firm. But there's many devices in a man's heart and you can't trust them. You, you can't just give yourself over to your perceptions, your thoughts and, and the way the instincts and how you feel. Because we looked at how these devices in our hearts actually allow us to make judgments very quickly. These calculations that we have in our hearts actually allow us to make decisions uh, efficiently. But there's a problem that comes with them because we can have what is called a cognitive bias. And that's an error in your thinking. You, if you see this, you run. If you see that, you hide. If you see this, that's good deed, whatever. You have these certain processes and things you go through your mind. But these things that help you make quick decisions sometimes can mislead us. And so we were looking at these different errors in our thought process and how these, these devices put us into groups because we want to belong. We want to have a sense of belonging because we, want to, uh, we don't want to be the oddball. We want, to, we want to fit in with the crowd. We're looking at all those different things. And because, because of these devices, it allows the group to influence us. These thoughts in our hearts, these calculations, these perceptions, these devices allow, uh, uh, motivate us and inspire us and move us and cause us to think and cause us to act. And we are specifically looking at the power of the crowd, the sway of the group and how we desire to conform. And it's just in the nature of man, we would rather mimic the group than appear to be odd or different. We'd rather just kind of go along with what everyone else is doing instead of being the one who says, to, says otherwise. And so it's easy to act then because of the group. And, and we looked at that as, the, as Jesus saying, uh, the thieves... It was a group of thieves that preyed upon this man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. So that's, this may be very, very easy and very convenient for me uh, wanting to minister on that subject of how the group thinks and how we act as a church and the kind of culture that we established in the beginning of something. But it was a band of thieves. It was a group of robbers that fell upon this man and robbed him and beat him, uh, beat him and took his clothing and took his goods. But then it's also the same thing about the priest and the Levites. The scripture says that the priest have acted as a company of robbers. And the very Old Testament was uh, characterizing the priest as having that same kind of mindset. So we looked at Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And it says, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So when Paul says, Be not conformed to this world, it implies a pressure. That means there's a weight, there's a heaviness, there's a force in the world that would want you to conform to a particular image. So as Christians, we are to never be conformed. We don't even want to be conformed to the image of a Christian. We don't want to just be conformed to the image of a church member. We don't want to be conformed to somebody who's simple and someone who's sweet. But if we're going to be in an image, we want to be transformed. So it says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So Paul is causing these two uh, processes, in, I, I want to say compete, but he wants to contrast them, that be not conformed to this world in its judgment, in its spirit, in its attitude, in its behavior, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So don't think like the world, don't act like the world, don't do what the world does by conforming to the world, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And, we're, and so what, we're kind of just saying a few things here at the outset to review these many devices that we have on our hearts, the world pressures us through those channels. And because we have these instincts and because we have these shortcuts and because we have this learned behavior and this nature and even nurture in our minds, the world can pressure us to sway our thinking. And if it can sway our thoughts, it sways our acting. 
And that we were just looking at many different examples of that last time. And I, and I felt empty afterwards because we did labor a lot on just these different biases or these heuristics as we call them. Uh, I say we, I'm kind of lumping myself in with the uh, behavioral economics uh, professors, but um, there's a, a word that, there's a, it's identifying these weaknesses and these biases and these behaviors. We even looked at that uh, robber's cave experiment where you just took 22 11 year old boys, separated them into two different groups, gave them names, and without any prompting, they immediately hated everybody else in the other group. And it was simply the function of ide uh, identity, group identity. And we're, we're against them and we oppose them. And we we're just looking at kind of maybe the academics of it. And I felt a little bit empty because it was really just setting it up to show that we're all susceptible to that. And how do we get out of it? You really can't humanly. Yeah. We used an example a couple weeks ago that even when you tell somebody that you have this bias and it's very, very difficult to overcome and a lot of people don't see it and they're not quick to recognize it. And that's so with everybody. And then you ask the person, do you have it? Like, oh, no, no, I'm not like that at all. Because even being conscious of it, you can't necessarily overcome it. We looked at uh, the conformity uh, bias, bandwagoning, groupthink, echo chambers, the in-group bias, these many different things that just relate to our natural lives and our natural way of thinking. And, and we were using it to say, show that how we could all begin to act as a group and even acting as a group come off pretty good. But that's not what God wants. God wants individuals to have a personal experience with the word. And then by that, join us together in a family because we all have our own individual experiences and not create such a vibrant social, a social community where we can just substitute a new birth experience. You can't do that. You can be very successful with group dynamics, but that's not what church is all about. It's not about just creating a vibrant group. And so if we have all these tendencies, a desire to conform, or there's echo chamber and group think and in-group biases, how do we guard against these tendencies? How is it that we can overcome these mechanisms? It's right there in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Be transformed. Be ch it literally means be changed into another form. And though one day we know our bodies are going to be changed, right now our spirits are being changed and being molded into the right kind of character. And so we want to be transformed, changed into another form by having our mind, the renewing of our minds. That means the complete changing, the renewing of our minds. That's how... We're going to overcome these devices in our hearts. You're not going to be able to do it by human think. If there's a problem with your thinking, your thinking isn't going to fix your problematic thinking. Right? right? Just, that's why we, we say this often, that the, the scientific discipline that has uncovered these things within the human thought process and with respect to social behavior and all these weaknesses in the psychology, the same discipline that diagnoses the sickness is not qualified to heal it. Only God is qualified to heal it. And in the message, God's power to transform. Brother Brandon makes this statement, and I'm wanting to emphasize what power is, is the scripture says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There has to be a factor that influences that. And he says it's, he sent his transforming power. God sent his transforming power to bring you out of this deformity of religion that you're in. In this deformity of chaos that we're in, God has sent his transforming power, his word, vindicated, proven, to bring you out of this religious deformity of ignorance that you're walking in, naked, blind, miserable, and don't know it. So the condition of Laodicea is, oh, we're rich, we're increased with goods, we have need of nothing, but yet is un does not know that they're poor, miserable, blind, wretched, naked, that they're oblivious to it. They are, in fact, poor. They are, in fact, miserable and blind and naked, but yet they're in their thinking, they're rich, they're increased with goods, they have need of nothing. Well, what's going to get somebody out of that condition? The Word of God. That's why in Revelation 3 it says, come, uh, it, it speaks and says, buy of me. Uh, you know, take this eye salve and, and, and clothe yourself, wash yourself, repent, because that's the only way that you could come out of it is if the Word would draw you out and in many re being responsive to the Word, experience the transforming power of God. So it's this transforming power that brings you out of chaos. It's this transforming power that brings you out of mere religion. Because we realize that even if you go back to the beginning, when Adam and the woman fell and they clothed themselves in fig leaves, it represented a religion just to cover themselves. And religion is, a, is just a covering. 
We don't just want religion. We want a genuine experience with the word and a relationship with Christ where I know I've been baptized into his body. I know I'm communi communing with him. And then the dynamics of a local fellowship and the preaching of the word nurtures that experience. I'm not just merely walking away from one idea to join another idea. That's just religion. And it takes God's transforming power to bring us out of the deformity of chaos of sin, the deformity of religion into fellowship with him. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the, to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So the word of God is quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. And that's, what, that's the transforming power. Transforming power of God is quick. You think your uh, thought processes are quick. You think your, 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 your computation power is really, really good. Uh, I, I don't know how many gigs of RAM you think you might have or what your process is running at. And uh, I mean, the human mind is really is incredible when you think about it because your mind is acting as a computer and computers exist because of human minds. They just don't, they're not just burped out of a volcano. I mean, it's, it's people that program these things and think about these processes and put these things together because it's a, it's a function of the human mind. This human mind is amazing, but the Word of God is quicker. The Word of God is more powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. And it says it can actually divide among soul, spirit, and the body. That's what the Word of God can do. And in doing so, I, 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 you read this. We could take other scriptures into this. The Word of God can minister to the body. It ministers to the spirit. It ministers to the soul. It's quick, it's powerful, it can divide even among these parts of the human. And this is a part I want to focus on. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. We have unconscious bias. We have unconscious thought processes. We have things that influences us and we don't even know why. To the point to where there's some scientists that believe that you actually do, are not a free moral agent. That everything you prefer in life, you can bring it back to some event or circumstance that influenced that way, you that way. And I thought, so I really don't like, doc, doc, or like doc, doc, Dr. Pepper. I really don't. Somebody else did, or it was given to me, and that's just the reason why I like it, because I was five years old at a restaurant in San Diego, and, and I had, which it couldn't have been San Diego back then. You couldn't get Dr. Pepper in the West uh, back then. But just something happened in your life, and now you like something, and you think you chose it, but it's just some other influence. And so the word of God is actually a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The very things that we're unconscious to, the word of God can enlighten us to them. The word of God is a discerner of our own thoughts. We, can, we, we place this scripture sometimes in the dynamics of the word, uh, independently discerning someone else's thoughts. And so you, maybe uh, two different ways, like the preaching of the word discerns your thoughts and the preaching of the word discerns your circumstances or a gift of discernment that could uncover something in your life. You say, well, that would have to be the word. But the word works within yourself. The, the word of God within yourself by the spirit of God is a discerner of your thoughts and the intents of your heart so that you can judge your own behavior. Yeah. You can judge your thought process. So when we say, well, we have these biases, we have these weaknesses, we have these tendencies in our flesh. How can we overcome these mechanisms? We need the word to examine our instincts. We need the word to examine our judgments. We need the word to inspect our devices. Yeah. Is that knee jerk reaction Completion to the Holy Spirit. Is that idea, is that bias, is that judgment, is that prejudice, is that pleasing to the Lord? And that's your only protection. We, we, you, I, listen, and I don't mean this as any disrespect at all, but we, can't, we cannot just kind of go with the flow uh, of the awakening of social justice and being a woke church and we're all aware of all the injustices and we're all aware of how people are sensitive and you don't want to offend anyone. That kind of awareness eventually just leads to hypocrisy within itself. Because you've got to have an absolute, you've got to have some basis in other, to judge things by. And this is our only hope. This is our only protection. Is the word of God, not culture, not science, not society. And it's the only way you can guard against getting caught up in, in some of the polarization that takes place. And, and so I, I, I want to say this to kind of set up our next step. The thieves, the priest, and the Levite, I was pondering this, this this week. They all represent a specific temptation for the lawyer. 
That, that in some way the lawyer ought to have been able to identify with the challenge that each one faced. Whether it be the thieves, whether it be the priest, or whether it be the Levite. He, he was being challenged with very specific roles or attitudes or behavior or temptations that he realized, I wrestle with these things. I fight these things. He's being challenged in the end. Well, which one do you think was neighbor to the one who fell among thieves? And he answered correctly. But you notice in answering, this is really interesting to think about this. He didn't say the Samaritan. He had to say, oh, well, well the, one that, the one that showed mercy. Almost as if the bias was still so strong in his heart, he couldn't say the Samaritan. He had to say, well, it's, it's the one that showed mercy. Boy, is the word not a discerner? Does the word not know how just to get right into someone's face and challenge him to where this lawyer was so had, he still wrestled with overcoming the bigotry, overcoming the prejudice, overcoming the idea that the Samaritan's not my neighbor. I don't have to be kind to him. I don't have to be good to him. To where he couldn't even say the Samaritan. He had to say the one that showed mercy. So these, in the scenario that we're reading in this parable, each player is significant. Each fact is important as Jesus frames it. And I believe this lawyer was being uh, shown a, a very specific example of a temptation that he faced. And our minds, it's a, a massive, complex cognitive circuitry. It just, it, 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 if we want to think about wires and circuits and nodes and all sorts of hardware and, and software, whatever, it's just a massive, this complex circuitry in our heads that's been programmed over thousands of years. And you say, well, Brother Aaron, I'm, I'm, only, I'm only 50 years old. No, I'm talking about humanity has been programmed for over for thousands of years. It's been under the weight and the influence of the world. The, mind, the human mind is the product of the nature and nurture of fallen humanity and a world that's under the influence of Satan. And so there's ways that we behave now, ways that we act now, that are the remnants of our ancestors of, of hundreds of years ago. That this is the way that they lived. This is the way that they acted. They had to be quick to recognize certain kind of threats. And they had, to, uh, they had to respond to certain things. And they had to endure certain things. And you say, well, is this, is, this is some kind of evolution. Well, it is some kind of evolution. We are the product of hundreds of years of development of our bodies and our psychology and, and our thinking as humans. And I'm wanting to emphasize this. That's the product of a fallen nature and then the nurture of a fallen world. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, Paul, Paul expresses th those things in these terms. He's talking about those that have been quickened, but now he says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world. So there was a course that you walked in before you were quickened. And that course was determined by the world. In, in, in times past, before you were born again, before you were quickened by the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you walked according to the course, the way, the flow, the influence of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air. So there was an unseen power, the prince of the power of the air, this, the, the hidden springs that were shown even in the book of Daniel, where we see demonic forces that rule governments, that opposed Michael, and, and, these, and these things that take place in hidden realms. The prince of the power of the air is moving the course of this world. He says, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So by virtue of your first birth, which all of us here tonight, we can guarantee you had a first birth. And so we, we all being here, we have a way that we should look at this and identify with it. By virtue of our human experience, being born of a woman, we have in our flesh and in our mind lust and desires, instincts and wants and particular needs, ways that we are influenced. And Paul is just telling us what we already know. He's just using very, uh, uh, a very thoughtful, thought-provoking language to say that when we were born, we all had our lives and times past, fulfilling the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of our flesh, following the, the course of our mind, what we wanted. And by virtue of our first birth, we were by nature... We had in ourselves the same kind of lust, the same kind of desires as someone who would forever be lost. 
The children of wrath, people who are ordained, ordained to wrath, don't think that when you were born the first time that there was something in your first nature that made you different than those who, are, who cannot receive Christ or those who cannot serve Christ. It has nothing to do with your first birth. So we are by nature, by our first birth, subject to lust in the flesh. And because we have this in our nature, then the nurture of the world can just move us where it wants us to go. That's why marketing is successful. That's why I feel fairly confident that some of you this week already, even though it's Wednesday, succumbed to some sort of advertising and bought the product or signed up for the service. You're like, wow, is it really that good? Is it really that amazing? Sign me up. And it's because they know how to market things. They know how to share things. They know how to spend things. They know how to get you craving something because it's just the way that the world works. And so it says the course of this world, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that works within the people for preying on the lust of your flesh, the desires of the flesh and of the mind because of your nature. Now, it says this in 1 John chapter 2, uh, verses 16 and 17. 1 John chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. Now, notice how succinctly he, play, he defy, just, uh, summarizes this. For all that is in the world. He's telling us, love not the world nor the things of the world. Because if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. For all that is in the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So we can summarize everything that is in the world that Paul is even talking about, the course of this world, the course of this world, the force of this world, the pressure of this world, the conformity of this world is lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. If you're going to be tempted, it's going to fall into one of these categories. If you're going to be swayed or moved to sin or to doubt God or have a weakness in your flesh, it's going to be some element working upon the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It is the, these three lust and this pride that the woman was tempted with in the Garden of Eden. It is these very same uh, lust, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, the very same things that tempt, tempted Christ in the wilderness. It's the very same things that tempt all of us on a daily basis because we are by nature subject to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It doesn't even have to be evil. Oh, I'm craving to do drugs, and oh, I'm lusting after this. It doesn't even have to be that. It's just the normal appetites that we have that the world and the, that uses to cause us to conform, to motivate us, to push us, to prod us, to make us do things that we otherwise wouldn't normally do and do things that are displeasing to God. And it says all that in the world is the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And those things are not of the Father, but of the world. So he says in verse 17, And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. There's your answer. If all that is in the world is the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, you say, well, then what do I do? If all that is in the world are these three things, how in the world am I going to live beyond those, get beyond them, live above them, not be subject to them? How am I going to do it? Well, do the will of God. But then that's like the, that's the escape. All that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. How am I going to do it? How am I going to do it? The Bible says he will with the temptation. Paul said, no man is tempted above that which he is able, but God will with the temptation, hath with the temptation made a way of escape that you're able to bear it. So there's, there's no pride of life. There's no lust of the flesh or lust of the eyes that God has not somewhere tangential to it, somewhere in the temptation, somewhere in the lust, somewhere in the pride. God has not set a door before you that you can walk through in obedience to him and escape these tendencies. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life stand opposed to the will of God. You cannot fulfill the will of God and the lust of the flesh at the same time. You cannot fulfill the will of God and be operated according to the pride of life at the same time. How in the church age book, when Brother Branham writes the church age book in chapter 9, he's, he's looking at how to him that overcometh will I grant uh, and, and these different scriptures. He says, now, what are we to overcome? And he says, that is the normal question to ask here. But that is not the actual thought of this verse. For it is not so much what we are to overcome, but how we are to overcome. Now, if I could uh, maybe even say this as a, as a way of subjecting myself, uh, opening the door for criticism. Last Wednesday was probably a lot of what we are to overcome. The, the, the cognitive biases, 
weaknesses and tendencies that all exist within the human mind and, and all related to the power of the group, the power of the crowd. And that would be what we're to overcome, but now it's being distilled down to this. It's not so much what, but how. He says, now this is logical, for does it matter? It, it, for does it matter much what we're to overcome as long as we know how we can overcome? Right. If we know how to overcome in every situation, it's not necessarily that you know what. I just need to know how. If I know how to in every situation, I don't need to know what I'm going to face. I just need to know how I'm going to overcome it when I face it. A quick look at the scriptures which involve the Lord Jesus overcoming will bring out the truth of this proposition. In Matthew 4, wherein Jesus is tempted of the devil, he overcame the personal temptations of Satan by the word and the word only. That's what he used. Even when the word was quoted back to him, he used the word back. Uh, and, and you realize that there's a way that he approached him to pray on the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Oh, d does not the scripture say this about you? To maybe force him into, into doing something to where the angels would bear him up. Uh, prove to me that you're the son of God. And, 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 and the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, all in a way, look at these kingdoms. I can give them all to Trying to prey on these things. And what did he use to combat it? Not logic. He didn't rationalize. He used the word, the word and the word only. And each of the three major trials that corresponded exactly and each of the three major trials that corresponded exactly to the temptation of the Garden of Eden, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life, Jesus overcame by the word. Eve fell to the personal temptation of Satan by failing to use the word. Adam fell in direct disobedience to the word. But Jesus overcame by the word. That's how he overcame. And we'll, we won't have the time to get into it tonight, but maybe I'll just lay a little bit of a seed in there. When Brother Branham preaches, how can I overcome? You overcome by the word and humility. Amen. And so he's saying he overcame by the word. And he says, and right now, now this is instructive to us. I, I'm not the woman in the garden. I'm not Jesus in the wilderness. But right now, and right now, let me say that this is the only way to be an overcomer. Also, it is the only way that you can know if you are overcoming because that word can't fail. What a, what, a, what a better metric to come up with to measure ourselves by. The world has all its, all its balance sheets and all its signatures and everything that it looks for to determine whether or not you're successful. And you can identify success merely by the fact that you're overcoming. That's what makes a successful Christian. Not your balance sheet, not what kind of model car you're driving, not how fancy things look or how blessed you may be in the natural, but am I overcoming? Am I, am I growing in the Lord? Is there a trajectory where the Spirit of God has lifted me higher in, in, in the greater realms of fellowship and deeper in the Word of God? We, can, we are successful when we're overcoming. And he says the only way you can know if you're overcoming is by the Word. Not if your neighbor tells you, wow, you, I've just noticed you really know how to cut your grass. And I really noticed that everything's just perfect. You must be a perfectionist. Nothing is out of order. My goodness, your garage is absolutely amazing. I'm astounded by how neat and clean everything is. I, I'm amazed at how much money you make. And I've never even seen a car that nice before. Those, those are just all things that speak of someone being disciplined and taking good pride in their things, which we all should. But success, real success, real Christian character is measured by overcoming. The only way that you can be an overcomer is by the word, and it's the only way you can know if you're overcoming is by the word. My, that's, uh, that's instructive. So let's apply this example to the parable of the Good Samaritan, that you can over, only overcome by the word, and you can only know if you're overcoming by the word. So you use the word to overcome, and it's the word that lets you know whether or not you are overcoming. And I want to I think of it in an obvious way, um, and you might, you might cringe a little bit because it's going to seem super obvious. But if you think about the thieves, they, they rob a man and they nearly kill him. So, and I guess I shouldn't, I shouldn't suggest that you'll cringe because I'm not making this up. In Exodus chapter 20, verses 13 and 15, it says, Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. Now, wouldn't you think those two might just be assumed? I mean, we're a group of people. Uh, we, we know how to act. We know how to behave. We know how to treat one another. But no, they needed to be told that you shalt, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. 
and ponder that for a moment, that even though you think this is decent people and we, uh, we function within a society where everyone should be able to respect one another and we should be able to be governed without certain moralities and certain rules or certain legislation, but here man had to be told that this is a commandment, you're not to kill and you're not to steal. And this is, this is something that might seem to be obvious. These are things that might seem to be obvious, but the word directly addresses these things within our hearts in order to, uh, I, I want to say bind us, but in order to, con, uh, to constrain bad behavior. There had to be a commandment that came from God. It says, thou shalt not kill, so that there would be an authority that a person could yield themselves to in a moment of anger, in a moment of jealousy, in a moment of rationalizing. Well, they did this, I ought to do this back. They had to constrain themselves and they could be governed by a commandment, by a law that says, don't do it. And these thieves had a law that they should have subjected themselves to. This is thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. So if you're in a band of thieves and you're all thieves and you want to go rob somebody, someone should say, well, you know what? The Bible says we're not to steal. And we're like, oh, what are you doing? You're ruining our fun. What are you talking about? But it says we shouldn't steal. That should have been what controlled their behavior. Even though we could think, well, man, wouldn't a decent person just think not to do it? Well, perhaps... But it shows the word addresses the issue, identifies the weakness. But there's a word there to, to, to constrain us to keep us in line and harmony with the right thing. Exodus chapter 23. This is maybe even more to the point of what we were speaking on last time. Exodus chapter 23, verse 2. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. There it is, right there in your Bible. There's a tendency for man to get caught up in the mob and do something they shouldn't do. So there's a word there that says, don't follow the crowd to do something wrong. Why? You won't be justified just because everyone else is doing it. You cannot just say, well, thousands of others were doing it. Everybody else cheats on their taxes. Everybody else does this. Everybody else does it. There's no excuse. The Bible says, do not follow a multitude, a, a crowd, a throng of people to do evil. It's written in the word. Why? Because human nature is just to kind of follow the crowd. It says, don't do it. This is a word that we have that can become a part of our, 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 our database, as it were, that, that uh, uh, motivates us, that enlightens us, that instinct that's there whenever some, the crowd is rising up, something's happened, a group's going one way, there's something that rises up in your heart as a discernment says, wait a minute, the word of the God, Lord says, don't follow a multitude to do evil, and your discernment kicks in and you stop and say, hey, whoa, 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 wait a minute, I don't want to partake in that. Then it says, neither shalt thou speak in a cause to decline after many to rest judgment. Now, that's a, uh, I could keep reading that to you and it won't get any clearer. <laughs> neither shalt thou speak in a cause to decline after many to rest judgment. In other words, don't change your conviction or your testimony just because the crowd is. I've read it in a number of different places and translations to try to understand what it means. Don't change your conviction. Don't give a testimony in order to side with the majority. Because it says after many, when many are perverting justice, don't speak in a way to join your voice with theirs when they're speaking perversely. Just because everyone else is declaring something, just because everyone else is espousing something, just because everyone else is saying something, don't add your voice to theirs if it's injustice. Don't add your voice to theirs if it's unrighteousness. Again, it's showing that there's a tendency for some that if they see the crowd doing something, they want to join with the crowd. They want to say what everyone else is saying. They don't want to be the one that's not saying something. In the society we live in now, it's a, it's a bully of a society. If you don't say something, they want to bully you and bully and bully you till you do say something. And the Bible says don't. If it's an injustice, if it's, if it's not right, if it's a perversion of righteousness, do not add your voice to it. Why does the Bible even speak like that? Because it's human nature to do it. And what I'm wanting you to understand is that if there's any weakness of the flesh, if there's any tendency, whether it be group dynamics or just human behavior, or own individual behavior, there is a word. There is a counsel of the Lord. There is a power, a transforming power in the word of God to change our thinking from natural thinking, worldly thinking to thinking like Christ. And the priest and the Levite, 
Jesus is clearly suggesting by this parable that the commandment to love thy neighbor as yourself obligated the priest and the Levite to render aid to the man who fell among thieves. He's directly, maybe I use use the word suggesting, but he's directly connecting love thy neighbor as thyself as enjoining and obligating the priest and the Levite to reach out and render aid. That's the very thrust of what Jesus is saying. He said, well, there's a man who went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among thieves. Well, the thieves are thieves. They're going to act like thieves. So now you have a man that's beaten and robbed. He's half dead, laying on the side of the road, and a priest walked by. Jesus is saying very directly, the priest ought to have stopped because the Bible says, love thy neighbor as thyself. Jesus is clearly saying that the Levite ought to have stopped because the Bible says, love thy neighbor as thyself. In other words, Leviticus 19, verse 18, Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. And there's other places we've read already uh, that address this love thy neighbor as thyself that would have been a commandment to the Jew, a commandment to the priest, a commandment to the Levite, those of the, the house of Aaron, that they would have looked upon someone, even if they weren't a Jew, they would have been obligated to help them. And so Jesus is using them as an example to show that you had a responsibility in the word. What should have caused the priest not to pass by on the other side, but to go and to help this one? The word should have caused him to do it. The Levite, and then by using the Levite, it puts it into a different category. Whereas you could say, well, the priest, he had to actually touch the sacrifices. He was more functional in ceremony. He would have had to give greater caution to approaching someone who was dead. But the Levite, um, he, he would be more inclined to have greater liberty. But listen, Jesus is actually exposing an error in the human heart to where they, he's, he, he's identified it this way. This commandment to love thy neighbor as thyself ought to have been given priority over all these other ordinances. And this is where I, I can even think of how they were legalist. Well, I'm a priest. I'm not supposed to touch any dead thing. Right? And uses that as an excuse to not obey another part of the word. Or rationalize with it. Well, you know, he looks dead and I, I'm, I, I can't touch something that's dead. And, and, and just the rationalizing that would have gone. Just think. I, I was thinking of it this way last week. Just the mental gymnastics, the mental wrestling, all the devices in the heart of the Levite and the priest that they're going through as they're walking down this road and they see a man beat up and maybe they're like, oh, I should probably help him. No, I probably shouldn't. You know, well, he looks dead anyways. Ah, it kind of doesn't look like a Jew. And just everything he had to go through. Instead of just having a nature that's subject to the word of God, and then acts according to the word of God, even have a discerning spirit that says, you know what, this, this, your desire to move past this, to not reach out, to not do the right thing, you're rationalizing in a way to, uh, uh, to remove yourself from the spiritual obligation. You're rationalizing with conviction in order to get yourself from off the hot seat because something is convicting you to do the right thing. So you start thinking about all these scriptures and all these statements and all these quotes as a way to rationalize why you shouldn't do it. We've all done that. The Lord's putting in your heart to do something. It might even be just to humble yourself to somebody who did you wrong, but maybe you didn't respond just right, but they did wrong first. And the Lord's really working on you just to humble yourself and say you're sorry. And you're like, but you know what? I didn't start that. I'm not the one that started. And you know what? What I did wasn't even half as bad as what they did. And if I say I'm sorry, then they're not going to realize that they were wrong. And you know what? This is righteous indignation, and they need to know that they're wrong, because if they don't know that they're wrong, they're going to stay wrong. And if they stay wrong, they can't get right, and then they can't get saved. So if I apologize, I'm going to send them to hell. (laughs) No! You've just went through this whole paradigm. You're like this, trying to figure out a way to not just do what the Holy Spirit was convicting you to do. Let's just say, hey, you know what? I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. So the Scripture says in Numbers chapter 19, verse 11, It says this about the priest. He that toucheth the dead body of any man shall be unclean seven days. So the priest, now I know immediately we start thinking, well, see, uh uh-huh, he had a good reason. Because we want to identify with the priest, right? Righteous, pious, offering worship, one of the, the special people that get to go in and offer the sacrifice. But I want you to notice something here. There's no prohibition on touching a dead body. It's just there was a consequence And not even a real bad one, but they just had to quarantine for seven days. 
right? That's what they had to do. Hey, if you've touched some, a dead body, then you're unclean for seven days, and they had to go through a process of cleansing. It didn't invalidate temple worship. It didn't keep them from ultimately offering sacrifices. It was just, you know what? If you touch a dead body, then you, you're out of service for seven days. You have to step back and ceremonially wash yourself and cleanse yourself and purge yourself as a priest. So it's not that to touch a dead body is an abomination to the Lord or that it was prohibited to priests. It was just that if you had to touch someone who was, who was dead, then you, there was a process that you went through for seven days to, to remedy that. And it speaks to a lot of other things, a lot of other types. But I, I'm pointing this out because the priest could have used that as an excuse as to why he didn't help. Well, if I, if I helped him, then, I, I, then I, I wouldn't be able to offer sacrifice. I'd have been unclean for seven days. And you realize, it, just the thought process, the rationalizing. What, would it have been an inconvenience to you? Would it, would it have been too much to say, I'll, I'll gladly go through the process of sanctifying myself for seven days if that's what it takes to make sure that this man is not half dead and could be revived? Because all it would have meant is for seven days, you're going to have to purge yourself. You're going to be unclean for seven days. He wouldn't be forfeiting the ministry. He wouldn't be forfeiting his position as a priest. But it was to him an inconvenience. It's to him he used Numbers 19. He that touches a dead body, he used it as actually an excuse to keep himself from fulfilling Leviticus 19. Love thy neighbor as thyself. And when you start doing that, you've perverted the word. Because you can't take one prescription or obligation or something in the word of God that you're required to do and make it compete with another requirement in the word and then weigh them and say, well, I, I'll do this, but not that. Because if I do this, then I won't be able to do that. Right. Notice what it says in Exodus chapter 23, verses 4 and 5. I'm sharing this just to, to show the weakness of the rationalizing that the priest would have been going through. Because it says, if thou meet thine enemy's ox or his ass going astray, thou shalt surely bring it back to him again. If your enemy's donkey gets loose, you're to bring his donkey back. If thou see the ass of him that hateth thee lying under his burden and wouldest forbear to help him, thou shalt surely help with him. Are you picking up what this scripture is laying down? If the one who hates you, if his donkey is laden with his burden, has fallen, you are obligated to help the man who hates you to help his donkey up. The one who is your enemy, if his donkey gets loose, you are to bring it back to him. In other words, there is no reason to justify bad behavior because someone is your enemy or because they hate you. Yeah. Well, there goes his donkey. <laughs> Gonna lose that one. Hey, why well, am your donkey? No, it says take them and bring them back. It's, it, you wouldn't want to, you don't take the donkey and push it in a ditch or hide it or steal it or whatever you do, donkey jack or whatever you do back then. <laughs> you, you, you'd help them out to the man that hates you, to the one that is your enemy. And if you were to do that to your enemy's donkey, how much more were you to do that to a man who's laying in the road, Amen. naked, beaten and half dead? The Bible would actually ask you to care for the livestock of your enemy, care for the livestock of a man who hates you. How much more would it ask you to render aid to that man if he was laying on the side of the road, beaten and broken and half dead? You couldn't say, oh, well, you know, I offer worship and I offer sacrifices, and if I touch that, I won't be able to do it for seven days. Like, no, you've got it all wrong. You've built this legalism and self-justification. It's the rationale that the, the, the lawyer used when he said, well, who is my neighbor? Notice how Jesus addresses this head on in Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. So you're going to tithe on, on the fractions of spice. You're going to tithe to where, well, here's the mint, and I need the, the 10%. They're going to get so particular and so uh, 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 legalistic on the tithing of these things, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. He's calling them out. You're really super strict in some areas. How did he say it? We may have read it already before. You can swallow a camel, but you choke on a gnat. Yeah. So there's things that you're so 
You get so bogged down on, strain on, you strain on a, a gnat and you swallow a camel. You're so specific about tithing on the mint and the anise and the cumin. But you leave out the bigger things, the more weightier things of judgment, mercy, and faith. You're all worried about whether you're, you're going to be able to offer a sacrifice. I'm speaking to the priest now. I think the Levite comes under this umbrella as well. But you're so worried about Numbers 19 that you forsake Leviticus, Leviticus 19, Exodus 23. You're so worried about one spot and one thing, and you're so particular. Oh, make sure you don't touch the sepulcher. Make sure you don't touch this. Make sure you don't wash the pots and do all this. And you're so careful about all this other stuff. But then the things that really matter, the weightier matters. Yeah. It says you, you forsake judgment and mercy. You laid obligations on people and you watch them wrestle and fight and try to figure out their way out from underneath all your bondage and your legalism and you don't even lift one finger to help them out. And then he says this, these ought you to have done and to not leave the other undone. Isn't that beautiful? Surely that, they would have just been all up and on. What do you mean? You're not going to make, they got a tithe on their mint. They need, need to be precise with their tithe on that. Jesus does not walk away from that. He says, you ought to have done the tithing and the mercy, judgment, and faith. Amen. Yes, you, you should do the other part, but you also should do the other. Don't do the one and leave the other undone. What good has it done you in the end? It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, he says, who also hath made us Christ, God hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. Let's make ourselves all included in that. We're able ministers of the New Testament. Yeah. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Amen. Right. Maybe just to shock some of you who haven't figured it out yet or don't know yet. I'm a lawyer. It's what I do during the day. It's what pays the bills. I, I practice law to make a living, but I preach to make a leaving. And we're all gonna we're all gonna leave together. So the uh, the the practice of law pays the bills. The word is gonna make me escape them all one day. And and so in the in the practice of law, there's a particular area that I practice in securities. It's actually written in one of the major areas that I that I focus on. In the in the preamble to it, in the introduction to the rule, it basically says, look, technical compliance with the following doesn't matter if whatever you're doing is a scheme to avoid registration or to avoid breaking the rule. In other words, the spirit of the rule has to be honored, not just the letter of it. If you do everything in order to meet the requirements as a scheme to avoid the consequences of not meeting the requirements, you haven't really met the requirements because the spirit of the law matters. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying. He's saying, and Paul is saying, look, we've been made ministers of the New Testament, but not just the letter of it. Did you do this? Did you do this? Did you do this? And just the legalistic, the black and white of it, but the spirit of it. Because the letter kills, but the spirit giveth life. Legalism kills. Legislation kills. Revelation gives life. Revelation liberates. You, should, you would desire for someone to do by revelation, not by education. You don't educate people in a thing. It's education, legislation, and legalism that creates a, a horrible group dynamics where everyone's just doing it because what well, we read last time, I, I better go to church or I'll be considered a backslider. Horrible, horrible dynamics. But you want people to willingly give, willingly participate, willingly uh, 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 act, and it has to be done by revelation. He says, the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. You realize if we make this application to Jesus Christ, those that knew the letter the best are the ones that put him to death. Yeah. And they crucified him by the letter. They, they said he was guilty according to the letter, but they missed the spirit of the letter that said, this is the one who brings you life. Yeah. So search the scripture. They are the ones that testify of me. So the Pharisee or the priest and the Levite although technically in compliance, violated the spirit of the law, the spirit of the word. I use these things to express to you that the word is our answer. Yeah. As we read already from the church age book, page 360, now paragraph five, it says, in his own personal life, speaking of Jesus, contending with himself. 
Does not the Bible teach us that as a son learned he obedience by the things which he suffered? We recognize this process that the son went through. He learned obedience by the things which he suffered in his own personal life. This is a very, uh, you know, uh, try to lift this sentence up. This is a heavy sentence in his own personal life. He had a personal life contending with himself. It's like contending with himself. What do you think was happening in the garden of Gethsemane? He says, let this cup pass from me. That he expresses his will, his desire, agonizing with it. But he says, nevertheless, thy will be done. There was a wrestling that he engaged in his life. There was, there was things, that he, that, things that he wrestled with and contended. And with contending with himself and his own personal life, he overcame by obedience to the word. How is it then we can overcome in our own personal life contending with ourselves? Contending with our own worst enemy. We do it by obedience to the word of God. Turn with me to, back to our text in Ephesians chapter 4. Verses 17 to 32. I just want to read it again just as we did in the beginning. Because notice how Paul now is instructing us. This is giving us very simple tools that we can use. That combat the weaknesses of our flesh. That oppose these tendencies, these devices, these mechanics in our minds. That cause us to do things incorrectly. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. So we ought not to be walking as Gentiles walk who only have their human mind, their human, uh, um, the, the nature they received by parents, the nurture they received within their society. They walk in the vanity of their mind. It says, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling, have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. This, this is fallen humanity. Their understanding is darkened, darkened because they're alienated from the life of God. Their ignorance is alien. Their, their hearts are blinded. They're past feeling. They don't have discernment. They don't have sensitivity to the spirit. And because they have this, then they've given themselves over to live unrighteously, to follow the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He's saying, this is how you live when you're carnal. This is how you live when you follow your base instincts. He's saying, don't live that way. Don't walk that way. This prejudice you have in your heart, these, these ideas you have of others, the, the, this, par this view that you have, this very narrow view you have of church and relationships. He said, get rid of all the vanity, get rid of all the pride, get rid of all the strife. He says, because you have not so learned Christ. Verse 20. He says, you have learned him differently if you've heard him and have been taught him as the truth is in Jesus. Taught what? Learned what? Verse 22, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. You know what your job is? To put off the old man. Be careful how you say it. They think you may be talking bad about your dad. But your job, all of us, our job is to put off the old man. I'm taking off the old man. Every day, Lord, I want to put him off. Every day, I want to push him away. Every day, put off the, the old man, the former conversation, the for, former life, which was corrupt according to the deceitful lust, the lust that laid within your members, the mindset, the attitudes, the tendencies, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Transforming power, quickening power, renewing my thought process, renewing my thinking, my attitude, my perceptions, my judgments, my discernments, and that you put on the new man. That's our, that's our instructions every day. Put off the old man, put on the new man. If you want to put on a new body, then keep putting off the old man now. If you want this body to be changed in a moment and twinkle of an eye, then we have a goal, we have an objective. Put on the new character of Christ. Put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true wholeness. Wherefore, this is putting away the old man, put away lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor. That's putting on the new man. Show us, put away the old man, put on the new man. Speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and sin not. Put away the old man, put on the new man. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. It's when we hold on to our anger, not just being angry, but when we hold on to it and we let it fester, it gives the devil place to begin to work within that anger to cause division and hardship. Let him that stole steal no more. There you are for the thieves. 
but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Putting off the old man, putting on the new man. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Put off the old man, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Put on the new man. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. These instructions are not to a group of people that signed up for a seminar on how to better traverse the social climate. This is, these are not instructions to people who just wanted to know how to be better social justice warriors or know how to get along with their enemies. Or, you know, this is an MLM. By the time that Paul was done, everyone was standing on their seat saying, fake it till you make it, fake it till you make it. That's not what it was all about. This was to the, the born again. Why? Because they're the only ones that could take the old man and put him off and take the new man and put him on. Everybody else would just be putting makeup on a pig. Right? It's all they'd be doing. Printing up the old man, putting on a, a wolf in sheep's, uh, sheep's clothing. It just would have been a, something just to put on, something fake. It says, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed into the day of your redemption. Your soul is sealed, but you can still grieve the Holy Spirit. So we, we don't want to grieve him. He says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. This is putting away the old man and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you, putting on the new man. You want to know how to overcome these devices in our hearts? Ephesians 4. Put away the old man. Put away his thinking. Ask God to make you more sensitive to these reflexes and instincts that we have in our heart where something happens and immediately we went, oh, oh, oh. Just be honest with yourself for a moment. How, how often it creeps in when all of a sudden, and I, I'm trying to think of maybe a benign scenario to where nobody's like, oh, well, that was really rude. But where something, you're planning something, you're wanting to do something, and then all of a sudden you find out that somebody said something or something happened, and your instinct is, well, I'm just going to disinvite them. They're not, they're not welcome to come over. And what is it? The old man. You immediately, you immediately begin to think of how can I take control over this situation again? How can I manipulate it? How can I maneuver it? How can I uh, uh, put them to shame? How can I navigate this situation where my, my pride isn't offended, where I can reassert my dominance? And immediately you're thinking like the old man. And what you need to realize is, wait a minute, that's old stinking thinking. No, that's... That's the, that's the way I used to think. No, uh-uh, I don't think that way anymore. I'm putting on the new man. I'm going to think differently. Lord, give me wisdom how to traverse this situation with this person because I don't know the right thing to do. Lord, in the times past, what I would have done is I would have stiff-armed him. I would have given him the cold shoulder. I would have alienated him. I would have withdrawn myself. I, I would have ostracized him. I, I would have ignored him. Lord, show me. Show me how to navigate this. Give me wisdom. I want to put off the old man. I want to put on the new man. Sister Elizabeth, if you'd come, I'd like to end with this statement. It's a prayer. Brother Branham prays at the end of God's power to transform. Well, actually, it's, I, it, it's a, a, towards the very end there. He says, God, he's praying, God, transform us today by your power, by the renewing of our mind. To turn from the meager elements of this world now unto the word of God. If you could just realize whatever, whatever you have in the world that is not subject to God is meager. Regardless of how big the talent is or how wonderful the skill. If it's not subject to the word, it's meager. What's the song we sing? Little as much if God is in it. It's the, it's the little if God's in it that's greater than all the big meager things that we have in our lives. Turn from the meager elements of this world under the word of God. That's how we're transformed. And may we be renewed by the transforming power of God upon the seed that's in our heart that we believe under creatures called sons and daughters of God. This is my prayer to you, Father, for the people. In Jesus' name, he says amen. This, this is our prayer. This is your prayer. You say, this is my prayer? Yes, this is your prayer. This is your heart's cry. This is why you hunger. This is why you thirst. This is why you're not satisfied with just play in church. This is why you're not satisfied with religion. You want to be transformed. You know there's more. 
And the, the, the more is the seed of God inside. If he hasn't been born again by the baptism of the Holy Ghost, it's always going to be crying out to be quickened. Crying out for expression. The seed cries out for expression. And that's the desire to see a seed surrendered to God through the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Be quickened to life. And then we're transformed into the image of sons and daughters of God. Turning away from the meager elements of this world to the word of God. I want to be renewed by the transforming power. That's your desire. Lord, keep renewing my mind. Keep renewing my mind, Lord. Keep renewing my mind. That's our only hope. That's our only defense. That's the only way to overcome. Let's stand to our feet. Say, Lord, renew my mind. Can you make that your prayer? Lord, renew my mind. It's the only way that we can break the conforming power of this world is when our minds are renewed. Because that's what transforms us. Say, Lord, just take this vessel, take this clay with our heads bowed and say, Lord, renew, renew my mind. Heads bowed, we want to pray for anyone that would desire prayer. And you could just lift your hand to the Lord in your need. Say, Lord, help me. Help me tonight, Lord. Our gracious Heavenly Father. Lord, People standing on their feet, heads bowed, hearts lifted to heaven, hands raised. With a heart cry that says, transform me, oh God. I'm tired of religion. I'm tired of playing church. I'm tired of the, the same old, same old. Lord, I pray that you would meet them where they are right now, Father. Lord, it might even be that we're so long been trapped into this attitude and this mindset that we're like that bird that was chained to a post that walked the same circle for so long that once the cord was broke, he didn't know he was free. May there be a soul that hears the cry today that they're free, they're free, and they can go free from the circle treading upon the same thing time and time again. May they go free. And Lord, I pray tonight for those that are here, the, those that would be streaming. Lord, there's just a, a tremendous sense of need right now, Father. And I pray that we would look to you and to you alone and take this into our bosom, that obedience to the word of God is the answer. That where you have spoken, we must say amen. Where you have asked us to step, we must step. What you have called us to do, we must do. And we cannot rationalize. We cannot make excuses. We cannot self-justify. Let us act now, Lord, according to your word, to do that which you have told us to do. Standing upon a promise that if we're in your will, you will keep us. So, Father, I pray for the hands that were raised, the hearts behind it, the needs that's represented by it, that you'd help them, strengthen them, encourage them. And take this service, Lord, as we've ministered from the Word. Take it and edify your people. And may you be glorified. We ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Bless the Lord.